So I will stop there, and I will introduce the first of the speakers whose work has pioneered the advances that we're seeing today, especially in this case in the world of genomics and genomic, genetic manipulation, an area that will play a very large role in the advance of regenerative medicine in the next decade, namely Dr. William Heseltine. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again. It's a uh, great pleasure to be here in uh, UCLA. I was a student at Berkeley, enjoyed my uh, years at the University of California, and as a professor, have uh, been at the university here for many different occasions, and I've always enjoyed it. It's a, uh, also a great pleasure to be addressing a general audience, and I hope as the evening progresses you're able to uh, ask us questions either from the floor or over dinner. It's one of the uh, great pleasures to hear what uh, people who outside, are outside of the scientific disciplines think about what, what it is we're doing. The basic problem that we all have is that we know that we're born, we grow, we live, we die. The first three of those is fine, the last we'd like to avoid. Is it possible? In that statement, we're born, we grow, we live, we die, is a paradox. And that is that every generation renews itself, that a 35-year-old couple will have a zero-year-old baby. Life itself, the fundamental of life, fundamental nature of life, is regeneration through generations. It is immortality. What we've come to understand about life is that it's based on a molecule, DNA, that contains the information that specifies what we are to become, whether we're a human, a tree, an insect. But as we learn more and more about that molecule, that DNA molecule, and through some of the work that I've been involved with, the understanding of genomes, comparative genomes, the ideas that have been deduced about the nature of DNA, how ancient it is, how it's related in one organism to another, have become clarified with great specificity. We can now say with great assurance something that was only speculated some time ago, that that DNA molecule that's in you, that's in me, that's in our children, that's in all living things, is a living fossil that's about three and a half to four billion years old. It is a single molecule that has reproduced itself through time in what is near immortality, certainly as we look at our own lifespan, three and a half to four billion years is close enough for immortality, much more than we can even contemplate. And it's that fundamental nature of life, its ability to re reproduce itself over time, to renew itself from generation to generation, that gives us confidence that it will eventually be possible to attach an individual life to that fundamental immortality of our DNA. Now, many of us have been working and thinking about this field for a number of years. 
About 10 years ago, I coined the term regenerative medicine. The concept was a relatively simple one. What collection of medical technologies exists today, can we imagine in the future, that would allow us to attach our individual self to the immortality of our DNA? And there were many that were possible. Some were beginning to come into view as realities. But let me give you one of the breakthroughs that gave us some hope at that time. And that was the advent of human stem cell cloning. As you have read, and as you know, certainly living here in California, we are now able to, from a single cell, which can be propagated and grown and expanded to create the essentially essence of our reproductive immortality. That is, a seed of a human being that has the potential to become all of our cells. It was that breakthrough that gave most of us hope that someday we would be able to take those cells and replace our parts one by one. We know that we have the capacity for many years to renew our bodies. All of us in this room have renewed your cells and your body several times over. The very material that you're made of is not the material that was with you. 10 or 15 years ago. It's entirely different chemicals and it's mostly different cells. So we do renew ourselves. As Audrey pointed out, something goes amiss over time and we're beginning to have many specific ideas about what that is. We can begin to measure those processes. But to measure the processes is not necessarily to change them. What can change them is replacement of those regenerative cells. Now, 10 years ago, when we began thinking about this field in much more detail, assembling pretty much the group you see here on the stage and others, we had several major problems ahead of us. We knew that somehow, you could take an old nucleus, the cells, the DNA from an older person, put it into a egg of a human being or another animal, and something in that environment would reset its genetic clock. Just as when the sperm combines with the egg, the genetic clock is reset and a zero-year-old child is born from an older person. It was clear at that time that with enough effort, we would be able to do that at will and to take any of our cells and with the right manipulation, reset its genetic clock so we could begin to use our own cells for that purpose. But what wasn't clear 10 years ago is how long that process would take. Well, today I'm very pleased to tell you that we now have that ability. About a year and a half ago, it was discovered that a very simple procedure can take any one of your cells, possibly any cell in your body, but certainly your skin cells and other easily accessible cells, do a minor manipulation and turn that into the equivalent of a zero-year-old fertilized Egg. If you do it in a mouse, you know it has that capacity because you can do that manipulation on a single cell in a mouse, implant it in the uterus of an animal, and a functional, long-lived, normal animal will result. That means we truly have the ability 
to create your individual stem cells without going through the process of embryonic cloning. That's step one. What was also clear is that although there was a potential to take an egg-like cell and it could on its own assemble a complete animal and probably a complete human being. We had no idea of how to get it to do it at our command, to build a precursor for a nerve cell, to build a precursor for a skin cell, to build a precursor for a muscle cell. It was very much left to chance. And that too is changing very rapidly. The confidence that we have got from the simple observation that you can take a normal cell, even an aged cell, and reset its genetic clock, has given us the confidence to say we can now reach in to any cell and change it at will to the program that we want. So we could take one of these cells Learning about what, say, a heart muscle cell does, a pancreatic cell that produces insulin does, reach in and change that in such a way that we can use it to rebuild our own bodies. And again, just in the last year, there have been fundamental breakthroughs in that area. That's not to say you'll be able to go to your doctor tomorrow. But it means that some of the most fundamental problems of regenerative medicine have been addressed in the mere 10 years since that word was coined. Making individual stem cells that allow your own cells to be used for your own regeneration. Breakthroughs that tell us that it's very likely going to be possible to make any type of cell in any stage that we want. Of course, the first ones will be cells for one of the major diseases. 8% of Americans, it turns out, suffer from diabetes. In India, surprisingly, in some cities, 20% of the entire population suffers from diabetes. That's surely going to be one of the first targets. But it will not be the only target. What do we do until we get to the time when we can replace with young, healthy cells those of our cells that are injured, damaged, or worn? That's where the other aspect of regenerative medicine comes in. The initial concept of regeneration was use any regenerative medicine, we use any technology that we have at our disposal to replace parts of our body that are injured by trauma, damaged by disease, or worn by time. Because in the end, what we care about is function, not how that function is achieved. If it's achieved by some painless injection of a cell that finds its way in the body and starts producing young and healthy tissues, we will be very happy. But if it's achieved by replacing an injured joint with a piece of plastic or metal so we can walk when we could not, if it's replaced by a bit of electronics that allow us to see when we could not, if it's replaced by electrodes that sense our intention and cause our limbs to move when they could not, we will be much happier than we would or before. And it's again in this field that the tremendous advances of modern science have come to bear. It's in the field of nanoprosthetics. It's in the field of being able to use a variety of different materials to replace our own materials. The one demonstration of 
where this is headed that you may have seen. We saw early prototypes in some of our very early regenerative medicine meetings, but they're now much more advanced. Is the implantation of sensing electrodes in the brains of monkeys and now beginning to be done in people that allow them to manipulate robotic arms with great facility. They play, monkeys can be trained to play a video game and would beat every single person in this room, by the way. The hand-eye coordination of a monkey who plays a video game is really something to see. So eventually your kids may be playing monkeys. But in fact, what they have done is they've trained these monkeys with these implants, they've read their signals, they manipulate the robotic arms, they then restrain the monkey's own arms, he learns to play the game and get his reward with his electronic arm. Eventually the brain adapts, uses so few neurons that the monkey now can use all three arms for whatever he wishes to do. Play electronic games, feed himself, or reach across a continent to create an effect which he wants through electronics. There are people here in Los Angeles trying to connect those electronic signals directly to muscle stimulation to allow the paraplegics to move. Those are the kind of advances that are being made and must be made until we have the ability to regenerate the spinal column. There's one other field that was referred to also in Aubrey's excellent introduction. And that was reaching into your metabolism and changing its speed. How to change the speed of your metabolism. Now why do we think that will work? You may have read of a whole series of studies in many different species, including mammals now, that caloric restriction extends life. In some cases can double or even triple a lifespan. Modern genetics, the ability to understand the internal workings of cells, has allowed us to begin to pinpoint some of those key switches and begin to play with them with various drugs. The one many of you may have heard is the substance that's found in red wines. And there's now synthetic analogs that are far more potent. We can reach in and begin to slow down the genetic clock, hopefully, without the pain of severe dietary restriction. All of this has happened in the last 10 years. I am personally an optimist. In my career as a scientist working the field of medicine, I've seen what appear to be miracles. In my days as a cancer researcher, I saw the survival of head and neck cancers, the programs I was involved in helping to craft, change from 15% to 85% five-year survival. It took us 20 years to do it, but it's a fact of that. In my career as an AIDS researcher, I saw the disease go to one that was virtually fatal, regardless of intervention, to one that's manageable as a chronic disease today, if properly followed and treated. Another virtual miracle. And I've seen that with systematic efforts, we've gone from the knowledge of a few hundred genes to all the genes of our species and the genes now of some 1,000 additional species. We can do great things when we put our minds to it. The progress over the past, past 10 years in regenerative medicine and longevity has been <clears throat> truly remarkable. The next 10 years, which most of us in this room will experience, is going to be more remarkable still. Thank you.